and the results. Thank you, Naomi. Bonjour à tout le monde et merci beaucoup d'être venu. Uh, ça me fait plaisir de voir les gens que je connais et ceux que je n'ai pas encore rencontrés. Mais je vais vous présenter en anglais. <laughs> Donc, uh, cross-generational changes in heritage languages in Toronto. I'm going to start uh, by unpacking that title, beginning with the question mark. So this is a group that's all about language contact. And we all know that there's a lot of different ways to look at language contact. There's a lot of different methodologies. There's almost as many methods as there are studies of language contact. And so one of the goals for the Heritage Language Project was to try and control a lot of the variables that go into designing research projects and analyzing data to better understand how language contact uh, affects languages and to see if they change. And if they do change due to, uh, can we attribute it to contact? And if we can attribute changes to contact, can we make generalizations about how that works? And if we can make those generalizations, what are they, both in the linguistic domain and in the socio-linguistic domain? So I'll start by just really, really quickly talking about heritage languages. I suspect that people in the room are pretty familiar with this concept. Um, it's a concept that has a lot of uh, synonyms for it. And the important thing that I want to highlight is that there's two quite different ways of thinking about heritage languages, depending on what literature you're looking at or which research domain you're considering. So in the experimental domain in psycholinguistics, uh, particularly in studies on language acquisition, the term is used to indicate a language um, which was incompletely acquired or to use a really <laughs> ugly word derivationally attrited by a speaker. And so in Polinsky and Kagan, for example, um, the following descriptors of a heritage language are provided. It is a language with limited vocabulary, incomplete morphology, impoverished syntax, spotty sociocultural knowledge, and not a fully developed register. So those are in red just to highlight that they are negative. They are less than kind of definitions. And I'm guessing that uh, for a room filled with Canadians that doesn't necessarily agree with everybody's understanding of heritage languages. But before I come to the uh, Canadian, let us say, definition, I'll share one other approach to defining heritage languages. According to Sylvina Montreal, heritage speakers are individuals who've been exposed to an immigrant or minority language since childhood. We all agree with that. And are also very proficient in the majority language spoken in the wider community. So this is very interesting to me, the idea that you would define speakers of one language variety by the way they speak another language. So um, if we turn instead to uh, the Canadian government definition, uh, such as uh, used in uh, census data, et cetera, it is a definition that doesn't make any reference to strength or weakness in the ability to use either the heritage language or any other language. It's just uh, that a heritage language speaker is an individual with a cultural connection to a language other than the official languages of Canada, born either abroad or within Canada, and descended from speakers having learned the language in the homeland. So that's the operational definition for the heritage language project. In addition, due to the methodology of the project, which I will tell you about, we have to add the caveat that our heritage language speakers are fluent enough in their heritage language to participate in an hour long sociolinguistic interview in their heritage language, because that's how we collect our data. So the speakers that I'll be talking about, the heritage speakers, and this is one other place where definitions differ, um, includes what we call first generation heritage speakers, people who have immigrated to Canada from elsewhere, 
um, but they immigrated as adults. So they've already fully acquired their mother tongue in the homeland. Second generation and third generation are uh, speakers born here in Toronto whose parents or grandparents meet the definition for first generation speakers. So let's talk next about how we can understand cross-generational change. Uh, Silva Corvalan notes that sociolinguists often relate structural features of a language as um, generation of immigration and degree of bilingualism as a result of acculturation patterns and represents these groups this way. So first generation or immigrants and she proposes that their language characteristics, their ability in the heritage language would range from being monolingual in the heritage language to being incipient learners of the majority language. In the heritage language project I'm talking about today, they may well be quite a bit past being incipient L2 learners of English. That's not something that matters for our purposes. Second generation speakers or children of immigrants have been proposed to range from being dominant in the heritage language to dominant in English, in this case, the majority language. <clears throat> and that fits for what we're looking at. And then third generation or grandchildren, uh, she proposes would be dominant in the majority language or maybe even monolingual in the majority language. Um, given that our speakers participate in an hour long sociolinguistic interview in their heritage language, uh, obviously we don't include any who are monolingual in English as part of our selection criteria. So if we think about these three generations <coughs> of speakers, there are certain <clears throat> commonly accepted outcomes that we expect to see. Here flags re represent the 10 homeland um, countries, well, nine countries and one region. Uh, and you can give yourself a pat on the back if you can recognize all 10 of them. So that's representing homeland, homeland varieties. We have an expectation that first generation speakers will speak in a way that's very similar to the homeland variety, given that they grew up in the homeland until they were at least 18 years old. But maybe they won't be identical because they've also been in Toronto for at least 20 years and there may have been contact and that contact may have caused changes. We also expect that second generation speakers will speak their heritage language <clears throat> a little bit more differently from the homeland. And there's this sort of unspoken accept acceptance, I think, of this idea that they will have moved farther along, but in the same trajectory as whatever the first generation speakers <clears throat> did in moving away from the homeland. And that third generation speakers of the heritage language will have moved still farther away from the homeland variety. Just tilt that down so my hand gestures are, are a little bit visible. Um, there's also an expectation that this movement is not only away from the homeland variety, but towards English. At least some of the changes in the language are towards English. And one further expectation in this sort of research is that there is some kind of a connection between how people orient towards their heritage culture or ethnicity and how they orient towards their language. So the more you orient towards your heritage culture, the more you would be expected to still be able to speak like a homeland speaker. And the more you orient towards the broader Canadian culture, the more people would expect your heritage language to sound different from and likely English influenced uh, compared to the homeland variety. Okay, so um, in Toronto, of course, we have lots and lots of data for looking at this kind of question. This is now quite dated, but I still think it's a fantastic article because this was a front page newspaper article highlighting where speakers of different heritage languages live. I estimate there's like two master's theses worth of research crammed into the information that is shown here. And I moved to Toronto after many years in the United States where you would never see front page coverage of heritage languages in this much depth. And 
without any negative slant to it. So I was quite um, quite intrigued when I first saw this, and I've just made uh, in larger letters on the side the the legend for this map, which shows the top ten mother tongues after English in Toronto eleven years ago, uh, from Italian, which at the time had three and a half percent of the population. And the languages that are in the font that Italian is in are ones that are part of the Heritage Language Project. Um, some of our languages are not in the top 10 because we wanted to be able to compare large languages and small languages as one of the, the dimensions of difference. And so in particular, here is just a quick glance at census data more recently from the 10 languages that are in the project. Cantonese is now the biggest mother tongue in Toronto after English, and so the biggest in our project. Um, and uh, Chinese not otherwise specified reflects all of the people who list Chinese as their language without saying whether it's Hokkien, Mandarin, Cantonese, etc. So we might be able to add another few thousand onto this this number, Italian mother tongue speakers have dropped quite a bit down into second place in the intervening decade and Tagalog is uh, catching up, et cetera. Okay, other people know a lot more about this kind of demographic information than me. So let's turn to variation and change from a sociolinguistic perspective. So um, just super quickly, we can look at, the, at uh, language contact from a macro sociolinguistic perspective. So things like language shift and maintenance, code switching practices, et cetera. That's not what I'm looking at here. Um, this project is a micro sociolinguistic approach. So we're looking just at variation within the language. So for people who are still speakers of the heritage language at times when they are speaking their heritage language, what kind of variation do we see in their uh, pronunciation, in their grammar, in their vocabulary. So the Heritage Language Project has both descriptive and theoretical goals. The idea is to build a multilingual corpus that represents in, uh, speakers intergenerationally, cross-linguistically, and diatopically in order to allow for comparisons that will let us develop general, generalizations about the types of variable features, structures, um, et, et cetera, that are borrowed earlier and more often in contact situations and also other things that change not necessarily due to contact. So in addition to the work that we're doing ourselves on this project, we're developing a corpora of each of the 10 languages with both homeland and heritage speakers that is available for other researchers who are interested in asking perhaps other questions of the data. Because we think that it's very important to try and push sociolinguistic variationist research beyond its monolingually oriented core and its majority language focus. So most variationist sociolinguistic studies look at speakers who are presented as monolingual. The researcher may not even check whether they speak languages other than the one that they're interviewed in. And in a number of samples that have been done of publications in variation of sociolinguistics, so in journals like Language Variation and Change or Journal of Sociolinguistics at N-WAVE Conference, 80% um, of the publications are about English, 18% are about French or Spanish, and that leaves 2% for the other 6,000 languages of the world. So we'd like to know a little bit more about whether the sociolinguistic universals that have been developed over 50 years of very, very careful research on just a few languages, it actually can be held accountable to other languages and other types of community. And by doing that, we also hope to promote heritage language vitality by engaging students particularly who are speakers of heritage languages in research, training, and knowledge mobilization, both in classroom activities and in other um, opportunities to be research assistants and uh, be involved with the project. So um, the first thing I wanna tell you about the methodology is that in order to understand contact-induced change, we have to make four kinds of comparisons. 
So I don't know if this diagram really helps, maybe just my words are easy, but it helps me remember to say everything that I need to. First of all, within each heritage language, we want to compare between the three generations of heritage speakers that we have to see if there are differences that might reflect a change in the heritage language. Second, we want to do that across different heritage languages and they make comparisons between the heritage languages to see if the same kind of changes are taking place in different languages or if instead we can say, well, if it's a well-established language, this happens, but if it's less well-established, that happens. If it's a big language, this happens. If it's a small language, that happens. If it's typologically more like English, this happens. And if it's typologically less like English, that happens, et cetera. So that's com uh, comparisons across the 10 languages in the project to understand the change. If there's change in the heritage variety, it's important that we check the homeland variety to see if heritage speakers are simply continuing some sort of a change that started in the homeland variety, or if it is in fact an innovation here in the heritage language. And uh, if I time things well, I'll show you about two homeland changes that we discovered by accident um, as we were just checking to make sure that things were stable in the homeland. And Finally, if we find changes that are taking place in the heritage variety, but not in the homeland variety, then we want to check Canadian English, Toronto English, and see, make sure that it has whatever feature we're looking at before we jump to the conclusion that the change in the heritage language is due to contact with English. So to do that, we, have, we are building a corpus and it is still ongoing of data in 10 languages, each one represented by th three generations. Each generation, which is generation since immigration rather than an age category. So each generation is represented by four different age groups. And within each age group, we, um, we record four speakers. Um, until recently, I've been saying two men and two women. My students today encourage me not to be so narrow-minded about that. So if we recruit speakers who don't identify as men or women, that's great. And we will adjust our tables accordingly. So that's about 400 speakers and they vary in fluency, usage and ethnic orientation, uh, as long as they're fluent enough to agree to talk for an hour in their heritage language. And then we also have been uh, recruiting homeland speakers using exactly the same methodology in order to compare to the heritage variety. So the languages in the project, three uh, Asia Pacific languages, three Slavic languages, three Romance languages, and Hungarian are the languages in the project. Um, if people are curious about why those languages, uh, think that's a great question to, to ask later. And when research assistants who've been working on the data collection in Toronto say, oh gosh, Professor Nagy, I need to take some time off from the project because I'm going back to Hong Kong for the summer to stay with my grandmother. Then I say, oh, that's fantastic. Take a recorder with you and uh, record your grandma and anybody else you can find so that we have Homeland data samples as well. Uh, obviously we're doing that by Zoom right now. And I have one poor research assistant who is simultaneously collecting data in the Philippines and in Toronto because he was so thrilled to be able to do that without traveling. But he's finding that the time zone differences still wear him out a little bit. But great recordings. OK, so we've already mentioned this, the way the sample is distributed and how the generations are defined. The data is all collected by students who are heritage language speakers. Um, living in Toronto, and these are some of the earliest uh, participants in the, or sorry, not participants, uh, research assistants in the project. And once they've recruited participants that fill one of the slots in the generation by age, by gender um, uh, matrix that we have, they conduct a sociolinguistic interview. The basic idea here is to collect about an hour of conversational speech about topics of interest to the person being recorded and ideally including some narratives where the speaker gets so excited that they forget that this is part of a research project and they really talk the way they normally do. 
After the sociolinguistic interview, uh, there's a question, a questionnaire that we call the ethnic orientation questionnaire. It's uh, the same one that McCall Hoffman and James Walker have been using for the Contact in the City project, which looks at similar groups of speakers, but in English. And it's basically ways of looking at asking participants whether they consider themselves, for example, to be more Korean or more Canadian. Um, and what we are curious about is whether people's views of themselves and their self reports on their language use and preferences influences their speech. And if it does, does it do it in the same way for all of the languages that we're investigating? And so in order to make those kinds of comparisons, we have to quantify the responses to each question. And I'm, I will just say more points if they orient towards the homeland, towards the heritage language and culture, less points if they orient towards English and Canadian in Canada. And the questions are about language use, language preferences, cultural practices, family, family and language uh, usages and possibility of discrimination of their uh, experience of being discriminated based on being a member of a particular community. After the recordings are made, the research assistants transcribe them in Elon making time aligned transcriptions that are available for searching. And then uh, people, students or I or my colleagues pick variable patterns to examine and we pull out examples from each of the speakers for that variable. Today I'll talk about voice onset time, uh, case marking on nouns and pronouns, and if there's time uh, pro drop or uh, subject pronoun, the variable presence of subject pronouns. So just for an example, we can look at the rate of use of, of one variant or the other across the generations and between the homeland and the heritage speakers, and we can also compare the effects of um, different conditioning factors to see whether the grammar seems to be changing from one generation to the next. And again, what we expect to see is this sort of a, a change, um, which we would recognize by finding a correlation between the rates of use of a particular variant from the sample of transcribed speech that we have and the scores calculated from the ethnic orientation questionnaire, such that um, the more you orient towards English in Canada, uh, the more your language will have diverged from the homeland variety or possibly towards English. Okay, so what we've been finding contrasts quite a bit with what experimental results show about heritage language speakers. And so I want to um, talk about that issue. And I'll first talk about it with respect to voice onset time, right? The, uh, the, the how long it takes from the release of a consonant to, of a voiceless stop uh, to the beginning of the following vowel. And we know that this from lots of research, that this is something that differs cross-linguistically and that is often susceptible to language contact effects. So for one example, um, the P in the phrase, it's a party has um, a durate, the voice onset time has a duration of about uh, 0.06 seconds in English, but um, which we refer to as the aspiration. But in a phrase like l'altra parte in Italian, where we have the same uh, intervocalic P in a word initial stressed syllable followed by a low vowel, that same P has a much shorter duration compared to the English. And so we might expect that heritage Italian speakers from generation to generation would lengthen their voice onset time due to the influence from English. <clears throat> and experimental literature has found this sort of a pattern. Um, again, going back to Montreal, um, in a study of Spanish voiceless stops, uh, she reports that heritage speakers did not perform like the native speaker group. So we've looked at this in a number of heritage languages in spontaneous speech rather than in elicited wordless tasks. And it maybe also is worth pointing out in speakers homes or other places like coffee shops where they are accustomed to speaking their heritage language and comfortable. So ecologically valid context. For Russian, we see some change going on 
the later the generation, the longer the voice onset time. So moving towards English, as it happens, the English rate uh, is up right about where the check mark is. So even by third generation, Russian speakers are not using English like VOT. The Ukrainian speakers similarly show an increase from generation to generation. Although even by fifth generation, Toronto Ukrainian speakers aren't using English like VOT measurements. And sorry, we only have fifth generation for Ukrainian. So we can't really speculate about why that is. But the Italians, as in a number of play things that we've looked at in Heritage Italian, there is no change towards English like uh, patterns of voice onset time. I put a downward arrow, um, but if you're good at reading um, the whiskers on box plots, you can see there's not really much significant change at all. So let's unpack that one a little bit. Here's the Italian data again, first generation, second generation, third generation. Uh, this graph splits it up by place of articulation, but that doesn't really uh, concern us too much. The range for homeland speakers in spontaneous speech conducted by an impartial researcher years before we started this project shows a VOT range down here. So exactly overlapping with what our speakers are producing. Nicole Hoffman's study of English from the Contact in the City project here in Toronto <coughs> shows a range for English VOT up here. So that's quite a bit higher than any of our Italian speakers. And as I said, it's also higher than anybody. Even the fifth generation Ukrainian speaker outliers are just starting to get into the English range. So that's, so first of all, <clears throat> for two of the three languages in, for voice onset time, uh, there is a change, but it's not all the way towards a lot of English influence. And for one of the three languages, there isn't a change. So we thought maybe it's not strictly a generational issue. Maybe it has more to do with individuals' ethnic orientation. So like I said, we have a 37 question questionnaire that asks about people's ethnic orientation, their language preferences, uh, whether they watch TV in Italian, whether they go, went to Saturday school, whether they speak Italian with their kids or their parents or their grandparents, et cetera, for whatever language. And the first thing that we wanted to do was try and reduce those 37 pieces of information that we had for each speaker to a smaller set. <clears throat> and so uh, Joanna Hoche and Nicole Hoff, I looked at the relationship among the different uh, response, responses to the different questions in this questionnaire. And we found very low correlation. So it was, uh, so in, if you ignore this green bar for a minute, um, these are our um, Pearson uh, product moment correlation values for the correlation between two sections of the questionnaire. So for example, for the one that is significant, people's self-reported language choices correlate strongly to their cultural environment. If they live or work in a place with lots of Italians, they choose to speak Italian more often than if they don't <coughs> live or work with other Italians. But none of the other expected correlations are either strong or significant within the questionnaire, which means we kind of have to keep them all to check whether any of them are predictors of linguistic behavior. The VOT column shows the amount of correlation between an individual's average VOT and their response to each of the different question uh, types of questions that are listed down the left side of the graph. None of those are significant or strong correlations. So we have, and this is for the Italian, Russian, and Ukrainian data together. So we have um, no evidence that ethnic orientation relates to voice onset time in the heritage language. Um, or that the factors relate to each other. And I don't, I don't, I won't put more numbers up here for you, but that's also the case when we look at null subject variation, it doesn't correlate. Interestingly, the same questionnaire does show correlations with speakers behavior in English, but not in their heritage language. And that I think is, is an interesting fact. Okay. So 
we are not really seeing evidence of the effect of ethnic orientation, but we are seeing change. We saw change in Russian and Ukrainian VOT. So um, the, 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 the debate kind of between the psycholinguists and the sociolinguists is played out in texts so that I can quote other people. Um, so for example, some scholars object to the use of the term incomplete acquisition to describe grammatical behavior of adult heritage speakers, preferring instead that this, the view that heritage speakers language is just different, that it is a new variety developing that is different from the homeland variety, and that this difference doesn't apply, imply any deficiency. We might think of heritage speakers as speaking just a different regional variety, the same way these days we all recognize that Canadian English is a different variety from British English or from American English. And uh, um, although several hundred years ago, that may not have been the case. So maybe we're, what we're looking at as Canadian Cantonese, Canadian Korean, and it's simply a different variety. And the claims for this idea of difference rather than deficiency come from studies of uh, Spanish heritage speakers in the US. So sociolinguistic perspective that it's difference, not deficiency, but psycholinguistic critique that what makes it difficult to see the language of heritage speakers as a variety of its own, rather than uh, right, just a, 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 an independent variety, is that there are clear proficiency effects. So we wanted to look for proficiency effects in our project. <clears throat> so this graph plots uh, the voice onset time uh, against speech rate of individuals. So uh, Polinsky has proposed that speech rate is a quick and easy proxy for proficiency. She's shown that speech rate um, correlates to uh, accuracy in gender marking in several heritage languages, for example. So the faster the speaker speaks, the more syllables per second, that is uh, rightwards on this graph, we would expect them to have more homeland-like, uh, sorry, the faster they speak, the more homeland-like, and in the case of voice onset time, that means shorter VOT. So what we would be looking for, uh, if that were beautifully true, is a correlation like the one in the dotted green line. Instead, um, let me take that dotted green line out of the way, we see a cluster in the middle and a few outliers, one of each generation, interestingly, um, up here just enough to make this slopey line that looks maybe not too different from that, but it is neither a strong correlation nor a significant correlation. So we are not finding the proficiency effects that make Montreal question the difference, not deficiency description of heritage languages in spontaneous speech data. So we go back to Montreal and we keep reading. Um, and I should say incidentally that Sylvina is a lovely person and a fantastic researcher and a great straw person to argue against without meaning in any way to uh, subtract from the really good work that she does. She goes on to say <clears throat> in the same discussion about difference versus deficiency, the heritage speakers with the lower level, lowest levels of proficiency are the ones who have reduced vocabulary, basic word order, and make morphosyntactic errors with case, gender agreement, and other morphology. Hmm, nothing about VOT. So let's look at morphosyntax. Let's look for errors with case so that we're really lined up with doing, with looking at the same part of the language that has been reported on in the work that she's talking about. So with Paulina Laskava, um, we looked at case across the three Slavic languages in our um, in the HLVC project. And um, I was a little surprised to learn from the research assistants that you can't just take a noun and go and look in a grammar book and say, what case should this noun have? Because there are enough different factors that are relevant to that to make it more complicated. And so what we had to do instead of, so, <clears throat> but, but 
multiple research assistants consistently agreed with each other about what was the prescriptively correct case for each sample that we each each token that we had and not only that <clears throat> that what they agreed on <clears throat> as the appropriate case out of a choice of between nine and 11 cases for these different slavic languages uh, was also the majority choice <clears throat> among all of the speakers so if we looked at <clears throat> second person pronouns as the object of a particular verb in a particular tense for example everybody would say oh that should be accusative and all of the researcher research assistants would agree and the majority of tokens we had in that context would show accusative case mask marking so you can either think about our coding for match as matching the prescriptively correct one or matching what the majority of the speakers do and it comes out the same so as an example, here's one of the sentences from a heritage Russian speaker, and it has cards in it as a noun that's the object of a verb. It should have and indeed does have an accusative marker on it. That's so we count that one, that token is a match. Here's a token of mismatch. We have um, the noun time that is being used in this particular context where it should have a genitive form which would be written like this but in fact it has a nominative form so that would be a mismatch we pulled out all of the nouns and pronouns from all of the speakers of heritage and homeland polish russian and ukrainian uh, to the extent that we had data available. We lacked, uh, we lacked data for homeland Russian and heritage third generation Polish. So those two uh, uh, lack of data um, are, because, are because we don't have data, not because there were no mismatches. What we can see is a very low rate of mismatch. Third generation Ukrainians are up to a 12% mismatch rate, but everybody else is lower than that. We can compare that to an experimental study reported by Polinsky for the same pattern with heritage Russian speakers in the US where the mismatch rate was 87%. And I can't tell you how many times we went back to our coding and checked to make sure we didn't have it backwards uh, because 87% means 13% um, correct. So it, there's a real, a real difference. It's true that Polinsky's study was looking at a narrower slice of contexts that she had elicited. So we also went and checked just in that subset of our data and the results don't change. The, the heritage speakers, when they're speaking conversationally and choosing for themselves what to talk about uh, are quite, quite accurate uh, with their case marking but they do use nominative in place of other cases more often than homeland speakers do, but even homeland speakers occasionally made things that the RAs determined were errors. And I should note, we did not look at any of the prescriptively nominative contexts. We left those out because heritage speakers don't make uh, mistakes there. And if we'd put them in, then we just would have had an average of 0% errors all across the board. Okay, um, so case marking, not much difference according to generation and certainly not and not uh, not significantly different from homeland in most of the contexts once we control for uh, the different kinds of conditioning effects and also interestingly a much lower rate of mismatch with pronouns than with nouns, suggesting that the rules of how to apply case are completely, um, remain complete in heritage speakers' minds, but the bewildering numbering of forms because of the intersection of case number and gender is in nouns is where, where what causes people to make some, some errors. Okay. Super quickly, I'll talk about the th a third variable that we looked at, which is the variable presence of subject pronouns. So here's an example of a Cantonese sentence with no overt subject, um, but there could have been 
a pronoun I in this big empty spot here. From a lot of work on variable null subjects, we know that uh, whether or not a, a particular sentence has an overt pronoun across many languages has to do first and foremost with subject continuity. If the referent of the sentence is the same as the referent of the subject in the previous sentence, you're more likely not to repeat the subject pronoun. But it also depends on grammatical person, which in conversational speech interacts a lot with subject continuity. In a sociolinguistic interview, people are talking about, I did this, I did that, I think this, I believe that. And so we have a lot of first person, and very often the first person is the same as the, the same referent as the previous sentence or the previous 10 sentences. So we do need to think about both of those separately. Tense also matters uh, partly because of syncretism in different verb tenses. So there's the person may be more recoverable in some tenses than others. Um, there may be other reasons that that makes a difference as well. And we see differences depending on uh, whether the, the subject is in a conjoined or a simple clause. So we code for all of those things to kind of subtract out their effects so that we can compare and look at the rate across generations. So uh, su subject pronoun variability is what we've looked at across the most languages in the Heritage Project. And what we see here is quite a lot of consistency between the homeland and the heritage rates of null subjects. Down here at the bottom right is the measure from a small sample of Toronto English, because although English is reported to be a non-pro-drop language that overt subjects are obligatory, in fact, in conversational English, we see a 2% rate of null subjects. And as soon as you start watching out for these, you, you notice them uh, flying by. So if there's an effect of contact with English, we would expect fewer null subjects in later heritage generations than in earlier generations or in homeland. And in English, there are particular contexts where the null subjects are more frequent. And so we would expect to see an increase in the conditioning of that difference as well, which I'm not going to go into. So in Italian, we don't see any difference between the homeland and the heritage varieties, nor in Polish, nor in Korean. In Cantonese, when we look at just the distributional differences, it looks like a difference, but it turns out that the issue is just that the second generation speakers talk about themselves more than first generation and homeland speakers. And so there's a first person and repeated subject effect um, that seems to drive that rate down. In the two places where it looks like homeland and heritage speakers are different, <clears throat> it turns out that there's a change going on in the homeland varieties, which hadn't been previously reported. And the heritage speakers are simply pushing that change along a little bit further. So when we, so when Elena Pustovalova looked at heritage Russian using the Russian national corpus, she saw that younger speakers had less null subjects, homeland speakers in Moscow than older speakers. <clears throat> and for FIDAR speakers, there also is a change in progress. There's also the fact that the FIDAR homeland data <clears throat> is my dissertation data. So there was a 20 year gap between when it was collected and when the heritage data was collected, which is another important issue to consider. Um, but in any case, we have accounts for why we see those homeland differences that aren't applicable elsewhere. So the Heritage Language Variation and Change Project is trying to look systematically at cross-generational comparison of speakers in order to see whether the heritage languages are changing. And if they are changing, how are they changing? And can that be attributed to English? So the conclusion, and we're still collecting data and we're still analyzing data and we still have obviously some gaps to fill in, but the interim conclusion is there's not so much difference between homeland and heritage speech when we, uh, when we look at spontaneous speech through a variationist lens. What this table shows us is the results from comparing uh, variable patterns in um, five different pieces of the language across the seven languages where we've been able to do the comparative studies so far. And an S indicates that the homeland and the heritage data 
is the same. It's not significant. There's no significant differences either in the rate of use of what might be considered the innovative variant or in the constraints that influence that usage. And a D indicates that there are differences between the homeland and the heritage variety, either with respect to rates or with respect to the constraints that influence the difference. And of the 17 comparisons that we've been made so far, um, about seven show differences. For, a, for Italian VOT, we've looked both at a context that favors longer voicing VOT in English and another context uh, that favors longer VOT in Calab Calabrese Italian, and we get different results for the two. So we get the same and different there. The D with an exclamation point indicates the only two places where we've established that there is a difference between homeland and heritage where the heritage variety uh, innovation could be attributed to contact with English. So really not very much uh, English influence on heritage languages in conversational speech in Toronto, uh, in, uh, in Toronto heritage speakers. So um, we are continuing to try and understand better what kind of generalizations are possible about the types of features, structures, roles, constraints, depending on your flavor of theoretical linguistics are borrowed earlier and most more often and how social factors are relevant. And this work would not be possible without an amazing team of heritage language speaking research assistants um, who still just barely fit on one slide um, and are presented here in all of their color coded for language glory. I am very appreciative of the work that they have done um, and the things that they teach me about the research.